10 to 10. Recording started. Okay, so now we're recording. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. This is the performance assessment webinar for Teaching is the Core. It's our second webinar in our series. Um, we have Dr. Susan Brookhart leading the webinar, uh, who is a, a leading expert in the field of classroom assessment and also an educational consultant. Uh, before becoming a consultant, Dr. Brookhart was a professor and chair of the Department of Educational Foundations and Leadership at Duquesne University. Prior to that, she was an elementary and middle school teacher. She spent the last 20 years studying and writing about classroom assessment. My name is Juliette Lines thomas I am a fellow for the Regents Research Fund. Um, and I have a few words to, to say before handing, uh, handing control over to uh, Dr. Brookhart. Uh, just a few words about uh, our webinar today. First of all, you may notice that uh, you're being placed on mute as you enter the webinar. Uh, that's essentially just to decrease any sort of background noise since we have such a large number of people attending. Uh, sometimes there can be a lot of feedback. Uh, so we, we've uh, muted people, but if you have any questions or comments as the, the webinar is going on and during the discussion period, we ask that you type in your comments to the chat box. Uh, for those of you who don't see it immediately on your screen, the chat icon is located on the upper uh, right-hand corner of your screen. If you click on that, a chat box should show up. Um, and uh, we are uh, gonna ask everyone to send your message to everyone, not just the host. Um, so uh, I think the, the default is to, to send your message just to the host, that's Vicki Jones, um, or it's under the name Vicki Jones, but you'll just have to switch it to everyone so that everyone can see your, your question. Um, Okay, at the end of the survey, we're going to also ask you to fill out a survey based on your experience. And uh, we use that information to plan any sort of, the, to plan our future webinars and to determine if there are any, if there are additional webinars that we don't have planned that might be helpful to you. So please be sure to, um, to fill out the survey at the end. Um, and, uh, Lastly, before we, we talk about performance assessment, um, there were some comments in the past about uh, questions about reporting expectations for teaching as the core. So just briefly, I wanted to go over those. Um, the first deadline that we have coming up is for December 1st, 2014. This is a new deadline um, for posting the proposed uh, plan for the use of funds and also the announcement of the award. You have reached the maximum time permitted for recording your message. If you're satisfied with the message, press 1. To listen to your message, press 2. To erase and re-record, press 3. To okay, uh, sorry about that. So, um, what was I saying? Uh, December 1st is the new deadline for announcing awards and uh, the proposed plan on district websites. Um, another uh, reporting expectation that we have is the deadline of April 1st, 2014. Uh, that's when districts must post the results of their review. Um, if you need any more information on that, you can find it on page 11 and page 36 of the RFP. And then the final deadline that we have is June 1st, 2015. Um, and that is for districts to post their action plan on the website. Um, and again, you can find information on that on page 11 and 36 of the RFP. Um, with respect to reporting expectations, if you have any more questions about it, I do encourage you to call, to call or email uh, Vicki Jones or who you would have received some emails from, or myself, Juliet Lyons-Thomas. We're happy to hear from you. Um, and uh, for the, for the, the time that we've designated for this webinar, we'd like to just focus on performance assessment. Um, so if you have any questions specific to reporting expectations, uh, email or, or call us uh, personally, and we're happy to, to talk to you about any sort of expectations. 
Okay. Um, now on to the, the topic of today's webinar. We are talking about uh, performance assessment, um, which you may have noticed had a number of references in the Teaching is the Core RFP. Uh, by attending this webinar, we're hoping that you're going to gain a better understanding of issues that are specific to performance-based assessment um, and how to use it for student assessment purposes in particular. So with that, I'm going to hand uh, control of this webinar over to Dr. Burkhart, and uh, she'll be leading us through the next hour and a half. Thank you, Julia. Uh, let's start by talking about what is performance assessment. Uh, performance assessment is when students either do something, perform a process that you can observe, or create a product, make something that they can turn in, that you can see. Both of those are judged, uh, scored by observation and judgment. Professional observation, by, professional judgment by teachers uh, based on criteria. Uh, sometimes people talk about performance uh, assessment being subjective, as if that's a bad thing. Actually, one of the best ways to, uh, to understand what students know and can do is for people who are used to looking at student performance, actually look at it and uh, judge the quality of it. So let me give you a couple of examples of what we mean by process. You could watch a student play a C major scale on their clarinet. You, the process itself of them playing it and whether they played the notes with the right tone, the right intonation, the right note, uh, that would be what you would be observing and judging. You could watch a kindergarten or a first grade student count by twos to 100. That's a process and you would judge whether they use the right numbers, and you might also judge how confidently or how um, fluently they, uh, they did the counting. Product examples are probably the kind of performance assessment you're more used to talking about. Uh, reports, dioramas, um, science fair presentations, things like that, that uh, that show that students can not only have knowledge, but can use it. I, uh, before I leave this slide, I want to say that the Teaching is the Core grant encourages performance assessment, and that is not because it is better than a test. It's because it is more underused than testing. People often give tests because they are either conventional or easier to manage. And if, if a learning goal says that students will be able to do something, really sometimes the most direct uh, way to find that out is with a performance assessment. And that's why the teaching is the core uh, emphasizes it, and that's why the first um, content-related webinar here is about performance assessment. Writing to a prompt is often is considered a type of performance assessment, even though paper and pencil is involved. Um, it, it, what makes it a performance assessment isn't the paper and pencil, it's that students have to actively do something. They're composing a, uh, they're composing a, a writing in this case, but not all performance assessments are paper and pencil. Some of them are things students make, some of them are other kinds of projects they do. Some of them have many component parts where students will make something and then explain it in writing. So uh, some of them are more complex than others. There we go. Performance assessments have two parts. People think of the tasks, but a performance assessment task is only half of the performance assessment. The performance assessment task has to match the student learning outcome you're talking about. So it has to require that students know and are able to do whatever the standard says at the level of thinking that the standard says. For example, if you want to know if students um, can use a microscope, not just that they know what the parts are, you have to give them a task that will require them to use a microscope and 
the for which the outcome may be maybe a drawing of what they see or maybe a slide that they've prepared, whatever it is, uh, must match exactly what it is that you want them to know. But the other half of a performance assessment are the rubrics or some other scoring scheme. And you can really kick in the head a performance assessment that gets students to do something uh, that, that matches a standard, but if you don't score it with the characteristics that you're looking for, you don't, um, when the performance goes home with the student, all you have left are numbers that don't reflect necessarily the performance that you had in mind. For instance, supposing that you had students write a report about um, the causes of the Revolutionary War, and they had to do original research, they had to look in multiple sources, they had to synthesize information, they had to draw some conclusions and support them. But if the rubrics just talked about the correctness of their facts and not the quality of their synthesizing information or organizing it for reporting or drawing conclusions from it, then once that report goes home with the student, the numbers that you have left actually only assess students' knowledge of fact. So a lot of good performance assessments that where the task is, is, is very appropriate uh, get, get sort of sidetracked by uh, thin rubrics that don't take into account the quality of the speaking or whatever it was that you wanted to make sure the students could do. Uh, you don't think of tasks as samples, but they are. Uh, you, you can think of all of the possible things that a student might need to know or be able to do in a domain, and then you think, I only get one task to, to get at all of that, unlike a test where you have lots and lots of little test items so that you can sample the domain of performance by having a lot of items. Typically, a, a project is one big task, so you want to make sure that the task itself requires a wide enough range of performance that you can actually draw the conclusions about the performance in the standard that you are talking about. We would call, in the last webinar, we talked about that as a validity issue. And you also want to make sure that there are enough student performances required in the task, that, that the task is complex enough, that you are confident that, that you have a good, good uh, representation of what the student could do and that would be called reliability. Uh, the New York State Department of Education has on its K2 assessment guidance uh, website a, um, a, a, some, some guidance about uh, developing performance assessments, and I have looked at it, and actually the advice that it gives is also appropriate for other grades, even though the report says K2, so if you want some more written guidance on that, the New York State website, at, uh, the Engage New York website, pardon me, at that URL uh, is, is a place to look. Okay, so let's, let's think about this performance assessment thing here. This little guy, uh, this little kindergartner, has helped me teach about performance assessment lots of times. I want you to, in your chat box, if you would please, Look at the picture, look at the performance, what did he do, and then try and, and answer the question, what is being assessed here? What performance did the students do to assess it? By what criteria would you assess the quality of his understanding? And if you can, what, what level of thinking? is being tapped here, cognitive level. Okay, I see one good answer, but it's coming in privately. Could you, could you put this to everybody, please, so we can all see them? And just uh, as, a, as a reminder, if you want to send uh, a message to everyone, you would need to, there's a little drop-down box next to send to, and uh, I think the default is to send it to the host. There's one. 
that one sent to everybody. There we go. There and, we go. And you can actually change it to everyone. And so thanks to uh, a couple of people who sent it to everyone. Right. Yeah. And yes, indeed. And this, the um, learning outcome of this uh, performance is testing is indeed uh, can the student construct an A-B pattern. And I hope you can see how the performance is a direct reflection of that. He had to construct an A-B pattern using, there, there it just comes in, mm -hmm. using little bear blocks, yellow bear, blue bear, yellow bear, blue bear. Um, and uh, so has anybody addressed the criteria you would look for in the performance? Application, yep, somebody got the cognitive level. In this one, the criteria are so straightforward that you might even miss it. The criteria would be, is each bear in the, in the A, each A bear and each B bear in the right position? So it's a fairly straightforward walk from the performance itself. It's not always this straightforward. I picked a really straightforward example for your first one. For the sampling issue, this guy can also help us. If you look at the little eight bears that he's laid out there, we're pretty confident because he did, did the same thing eight times or four times that he can do a um, an A B pattern. And somebody just brought up, you could also ask him to explain it, which would be an excellent um, extension of this performance assessment. That way, you have tapped two different things. Can he do it? And is he aware of what he's doing? It can he name it and, and explain it, which would be even better. And then you could judge the quality of his explanation as well as the correctness of his bear placement. Uh, if you're thinking about sampling, how confident would you be that he could make an A-B pattern if he had six bears out there in the right position? Yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue. Probably pretty confident, but less confident than you are now. What if he only had four bears out there? Hmm. And of course, what if he only had a yellow bear and a blue bear out there? Would you be sure he knew how to make an A-B pattern? Probably not. So getting this, because it's such a concrete performance, it's a nice illustration of the importance of getting enough behavior. Okay, thanks to the people who answered, and uh, I hope the people who are reading, uh, next time we, we bring up a, a slide for comments, um, you now know how it is done. Okay, for most of this webinar, we're going to talk about task features in performance assessments that can vary so that you can tweak your task to make it tap exactly what knowledge, skills, and level of thinking you want it to. There are six of them there on the board and on the screen. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the first three because I think they're pretty obvious. Performance assessments can take a long time or a short time. They can be about groups or individuals, they can be process or product. But varying the cognitive level, amount of structure in the task, and the difficulty, uh, we will talk about a little more because those are a little bit more um, chewy. <laughs> also make sure that when you measure, uh, use performance assessments, that you don't throw in extraneous things that would interfere with measurement. The famous example of this is math word problems that are written at a high reading level, so you can't tell if the kid can't do the math or just couldn't understand the problem. That's the famous one. But in any performance, uh, artistic ability or stage presence or personality, while those are all important and interesting aspects of a child, if those aren't what you're going to be uh, uh, assessing, you need to be able to, to design a task where you can bracket those, ignore those, and uh, observe the, the, what the, the student knows and can do um, without being unduly influenced by those things. And I think uh, this is a slide most of you ought to be familiar with, but um, when you control the cognitive level, you need to have some sort of taxonomy in your mind. You can use blooms, you can use Webb's depth of knowledge, there are other taxonomies, but you have to be aware of what you're asking students to do, and we'll play with that in a couple of examples coming up. So here's another one for you to think about. Uh, this time, let's just do two questions. 
what is assessed and at what cognitive level? Now, let me tell the story of this assessment first. This was a fifth grade teacher whose students had read a book called Maniac McGee. And some of them actually wrote character studies, but some students did this open mind assessment where they colored a silhouette of maniac on the front and on the back they did what you see on your screen, which I won't describe because I want you to figure out what's being assessed. Character trait. <laughs> Somebody say, okay. Character traits, true. Uh, what about character traits? The, the student had to do more than just name some character traits to do this. Yay, character traits with specific examples from the text is evidence, which is a, a large part, this wasn't particularly done as a common core example in the classroom I got it from, but uh, there's a lot in the common core about reasoning from text. And if you were to read all of the little evidence pieces from text that this student put as support for the character traits that he deduced, you would find that they do in fact match. So this is a good example of making sure that your scoring, oh, I forgot to ask cognitive level. I asked it and then nobody, um, I didn't, what cognitive level? Assuming that they hadn't talked about this in class, assuming this, the student actually did this work mentally himself. Getting some evaluates. It, if you are talking about evaluating the character, I see where you're going. I think many English teachers would call this analysis. There's an analyze. Uh, because you're just taking apart uh, things that the student, uh, things that the character said or did in, in a book and reasoning from them. Um, and I will leave the English teachers to uh, to fuss over that, but it is at least at the, at the analyzed level. Notice that this student isn't, isn't required then to write a, um, he didn't write a character study, but he did demonstrate with this performance that he understands the character of Maniac McGee and he can support where he got that. Uh, so if you wanted to score this, and keep the idea of student thinking in it, you would need a rubric or other scoring scheme that not only said, did the student conclude accurately what, what uh, Maniac McGee's character was about, but also do the supporting details actually support the character traits that the student um, is claiming they do? And if you had him explain it, you could, you could also observe, does, is, is he able to use sound reasoning to get from those supporting details to the character traits? And in that way, you would have in your final rubric score, once this paper went home with this child, you would still have the evidence of his analysis as well as the correctness of his conclusions about maniac. Okay, the next slide is for people who tell me that lower achievers can't do performance assessment at the analyze level. This student was a third grader, but she was a Title I reading student. She didn't read very well, and the story that they read was not a very um, difficult story. It was a very low grade level. It was about Snowzilla, and their assignment was to compare and contrast Snowzilla with a regular snowman like they would make in their backyard. So I want you to, uh, so it's analysis, yes, um, assuming that nobody told the little girl about parts of the, a regular snowman, that she just had to take what she knew about, uh, analyze parts of the story about Snowzilla and match it to something else, namely a regular snowman in her life. Just take a look at the analysis that she did. Not the writing, which is not so great. Um, and, and notice that I also have some teacher writing there. That the teacher submitted to me something that she, um, she had already given feedback on. Um, but look at the reasoning there. It, 
if, if you look carefully, you'll notice that while the student doesn't read very well, she can think. She has categories of size, eyes, and hat, and she has appropriate comparisons for each one. And then her thing that they have in common, which is not two things, it's actually only one thing, but uh, that they're being made of snow, is actually something they do have in common. So if you were using this very brief performance assessment to get at whether the student could do some analysis based on text and based on connecting text with her own life, which is, uh, again, a, a a thing that the Common Core encourages, you would have you would have that evidence here, even though this child doesn't it is not a very good student. Uh, I, I picked this example, um, brief though it is, to uh, because I know that there are probably some of you out there thinking, yeah, but what about students who aren't very uh, advanced? Um, don't don't hold back on assessing higher order thinking and wait for students to be able to do all of the knowledge and recall tasks that you would, might like them to. Uh, they'll never learn to think if you don't do that. Okay, here's an example that some of you probably already, uh, the assignment some of you probably already use. This is a math example. Uh, the students have learned about polygons. And uh, this is, uh, also an example of how higher order thinking doesn't need to be particularly difficult. Higher order thinking and uh, level of thinking and difficulty are two different dimensions. It's a fairly easy assignment. The assignment was take what you know about polygons, draw a picture of something from your own life that includes at least four polygons, label the polygons. And this picture that we got is actually a very common, except for the polygon part, uh, lots of young children's drawings are pictures like this with a house and a little walkway and a tree. Um, what's what's um, higher order thinking about it is that she had to connect two, and I'll put them in quotes, texts. She had to connect, connect some geometry knowledge and the text, if you will, of her own life experience, the world as she knows it, and put them together. So it's a creative assignment. It's not, as I said, it's not hugely um, out of the ordinary, but the student, to this student, they had to create something. And she also got to show her uh, knowledge of um, geometry. So again, all performance assessments do not have to be great big multi-week projects. Some of them are small. This one is hard to read, but uh, it's, I've used every computer enhancing program that I can think of. It's just the best I can do. Uh, this is an example of also a creation. This is a, an original math problem from a seventh grade learning support math student who was learning uh, percent discount. That was the math content. And uh, the, the teacher had them do their own problems that required percent discount. And I will, sh I, I hope you are, are, I'll read this to you, but I hope you're trying to read it yourself. This student doesn't write very well. He doesn't even draw very well. But if you look at the content of the question, he clearly understands what a percent discount math problem is and how that would help you with a situation. Uh, he's talking about riding here of motorcycles, not horses. And the problem, he, so he's drawn three little things, a helmet with a price of $105.50, uh, the chest protector little jacket, uh, and, and boots. And he's given each of those things prices in his little store. And his, tech, his problem is if Brian has $100 and wants to buy a helmet and also has a coupon for 10% off, how much money will he have left? Now, he didn't spell buy properly, and he didn't put a question mark at the end. But if you look at that, he has drawn the coupon for a helmet, 10% off. He's drawn some other coupons. Um, and he's got the price for the helmet. 
he has come up with a multi-step problem. The person solving the problem would have to decide what 10% off of 105.50 is, and then decide how much left you'd have out of 100 if you spent that. So it's a two-step problem. And it also shows by setting up a scenario where the math content is exactly what you would need, he also shows that he understands that kind of problem. So again, I picked a, I picked a performance assessment from a student who is not particularly um, a, a high achiever to try and convince people at this webinar that performance assessment doesn't have to be big and hard and daunting. Of course, it can be a large project, and that's the kind people often think of, and we'll see some examples of those later. But um, I guess I can get off my soapbox now. A performance assessment does not have to be something that is way more complicated than a test um, and, and something that you don't want to, where you don't want to go there. Okay. So solving a routine problem, we're still talking about cognitive level here. Uh, I, we had two examples of Analyze, Maniac McGee and the Snowzilla. Uh, and two examples of create, uh, the, the polygons and the math problem. And now just to finish up talking about cognitive level, uh, I, I want to remind you that solving a routine problem like in math is usually not considered higher order thinking. Uh, and it's also a very structured task. But if you have to explain your reasoning in words, that's usually considered analysis because you have to analyze your own solution. And if you have to invent your own problem, that's usually considered uh, creation. People who went to school, to teacher ed school a long time ago might call it synthesis. That was the old Bloom's taxonomy term for it. Creation is the new one. Um, and also, inventing your own problem is less structured because there is more room for student um, choice. Okay, time for you guys again to do a little work. Um, uh, let me just say it's okay with me if you hate this. Uh, this is a, a, tr a real performance assessment, quote, unquote, that I got from the internet that has been literally, <laughs> like they say in the movies, edited to fit your screen, and that's all. So critique this, and then um, after we get done ripping it apart, you won't be the person who writes one like this. <laughs> And type, uh, of course, you have to read it first, so take some time to read it, and then type your comments into the chat. I'm using this example because I see a lot of performance assessments that do look like this. And when you try and pinpoint what they actually measure, you come up short. Not sure what it is measuring. <laughs> My kids would like it. Yeah, well, let, you can also design performance assessments they would like but that are also good for them. Too many tasks, good call. Ah, too many components, but also a new idea there. No expectations for any of them. Excellent. What you're seeing is expectations if you read them, the little bullets at the bottom, if you read them carefully, you find that those are really not expectations for the learning the students will show. Those are expectations about the directions. Focus is just on the formatting, exactly. So this is not, despite the fact that you will see lots of performance assessments like this, this is not a good one. If the if 
and I say if with a capital I and F, if the intent was to uh, assess what students understood about the age of exploration, where European explorers came across the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, ended up in the, what, what they would have called the New World because of at least two reasons, um, more in some instances, at least the reason that there was uh, political trouble in Europe and, and some of the heads of state needed money and they needed to go find places where they could get it. And also that uh, sort of the stars were aligned because navigation equipment had just uh, evolved to the point where it actually was possible to sail all the way across the ocean, the technology, if you will. Um, it was possible to sail all the way across the ocean without getting lost as, as it had not been formally. There's none of that in there. In fact, one of the, uh, the person who just asked, what does the rubric look like? There wasn't one. I hope, uh, I, I really hope nobody took this off the internet and actually did it because it's a terrible performance assessment. Uh, in fact, one smart aleck teacher said to me when I was using this in a in a face to face teacher workshop, I would draw an oval and tell the teacher that that was my pod and that I was going to the moon. And I, you know, she was being a smart aleck, but there really is nothing in this assessment that. Um, that helps students do anything. She really couldn't defend, a teacher really couldn't defend against that. If this measures anything, and it, I would submit it really doesn't, um, uh, map skills maybe, but it's way too much stuff just for some map skills. All of the comments that are coming in are right on point. There are no standards. It's a bunch of stuff to do, it's busy work. It's just busy work performance style. So I, I, this is, I, I often use this as the example I love to hate uh, to sort of show people what performance assessment should not look like. It is, uh, it needs to have criteria and it needs to have directions for a task where students actually need to show what they know. So, if we had actually asked this, instead of asking you to type it into the chat box, um, at best, map skills, if that. And the most important criticism, A, B, or C? I would say B, the fact that there just are no criteria. It's true that quality levels are not specified, but I think the bigger problem is that there's, there are no criteria. And before that, there's no, no real specified work for them to do something on. Okay, so now we've had the bad example. Let's hurry up and get to some better ones. Um, if, when we actually do the, the better examples, I'm going to want you to talk about not only cognitive level, but also uh, task structure and difficulty. So let's, let's set that up a little bit first. Just like open and closed questions are more and less structured, tasks can be more and less structured. In more structured tasks, the task clearly defines the problems with a lot of detailed directions and usually, uh, and what will happen is all of the good performances will look the same. And that is, there's nothing wrong with that if what you want to assess is something that is structured. There aren't uh, alternative ways to play the C major scale. You have to play C and then D and then E in the right order all the way up the scale. Less structured tasks, the student is free to select or define the problem themselves the task directions don't give guidance. The students have to actually figure out how to proceed. And at that rate, there will be several ways to have a good final performance. Of course, there will be several ways not to have a good final performance too. But you'll have, um, 
lots of different ways to be good. Typically, if your standard says that students can analyze and apply or, or analyze and, and evaluate and create, um, you want a little bit of a freedom for students to be able to do that because unless they have that freedom, if they're just executing a plan that you designed in the task, they're not, um, they might not get all the way to analyze, evaluate, or create. I like to use this framework because most tasks do have all these three parts. The, the task becomes a problem for the student to solve. How will I make a good diorama of the Battle of Little Bighorn? Or how will I answer this question? Or how will I make, a, how will I go about putting together a good report on this question? Each task then has something that the students actually do, typically involving strategies and materials. And each class then, each task then has a final answer, or a final product, or a final performance that they have to either turn in or do, depending on whether it's product or performance. And each of those are op opportunities for you to either give complete closed directions, give completely open directions, or give them some choice, guide them, but not specify. For example, the Maniac McGee piece that we saw earlier, the problem was closed. The students had to put in Maniac's mind character traits supported from the book. They had, the strategies and materials were closed. They had to use their crayons and that mind silhouette, head silhouette, and they had to use the book Maniac McGee. And the final product was also specified. It had to be uh, what you saw there, not a paragraph, not a speech. It had to be in the form of the, the visual that you saw. If you had wanted to open that up a little so that you could, that you had some things that were guided, you could have said you need to uh, come up with character traits from Maniac McGee and support them from the book, provide, which would mean that the problem was provided. And you could have opened up the strategies and materials and said you could either make those notes inside his mind, inside his head, like we saw, or you could write a paragraph, or you could give a speech. That would open it up, but not to anything the student wanted to do, just a set of things. Uh, and that would mean that the solution or final product was guided, but not provided. Um, the, the, the question is, which is the better performance assessment? The question is, which most closely gets at exactly what you want to assess? And finally, we're going to talk about controlling the level of difficulty so that when we get to our examples of good examples, um, we'll be able to do all of that. Uh, what makes something difficult depends on both the task and the student. And remember I said that difficulty is not the same thing as cognitive level. Uh, think of a question where you might ask a student, who is the main character in the cat in the hat? Well, the cat. That's a recall level question or comprehension level question, but it's um, pretty easy. Uh, contrast that with asking a student to remember the names of all of the characters in Hamlet and write them down spelled correctly. That's just a recall level task, but it's much more difficult. So that, and then that is a level of difficulty that depends on the task, not the student. Uh, but, here we go. There are also difficulties that depend on the student. For instance, if you asked me to do a very easy translation, uh, to translate a very easy sentence in Greek, I couldn't do it because I don't speak Greek. So the fact that it was an easy sentence would, in the content, would, would still, it would still be difficult for me because of my background. I don't have prior knowledge of Greek. So when you are adjusting the difficulty of a task, you have to take into account student background and the actual content of the task, the discipline content of the task. If you want to adjust for difficulty for students, take into account tasks that 
differ in their requirements for prior knowledge or prior experiences. Uh, typically, we make performance tasks based on things that students do know something about, um, their own life or baseball or shopping or something, uh, but you can adjust difficulty by adjusting that. And then, of course, there are also difficulty uh, adjustments that you can make in the task itself. If you're going to adjust difficulty by varying the elements in the task, I would suggest you vary the problem last because the problem itself usually goes to your standards. So maybe the, um, the goal is that everybody needs to be able to uh, derive some meaning from informational text, and in specifically, we're talking about understanding informational texts that are or organized in a temporal sequence. So the kind of informational text that would say, first do this, then do that, then do this, or, or, or first this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Um, instead of changing the problem for students who are uh, more and less accomplished at reading, change the material. Use two different tasks, tests, pardon me, texts, one that's got temporal organization but is easier to read and one that's got temporal organization but is more difficult to read. And that way you are still assessing the same, um, the same task. Only vary the question itself if you have tried all of the others and you can't, uh, you just can't get it to where you need it for a student. Okay, your turn again. Here is a simple language arts example. Read it. And I want you to, let's start with cognitive level. What cognitive level do you think this is tapping, at, at least at its highest? And how could you revise that task if that cognitive level was not what you had in mind? Create, yep, because they have to write their own poem. Then, of course, they have to analyze their own essay, so they are doing some analysis as well. But usually we talk about, uh, as, as the respondent said, you talk about the highest level that it taps. Well, supposing you didn't want to tap creation, you wanted just to tap analysis. How would you revise this example to get that? Give the students the poem. Excellent. This is not provide a poem. You, th this is the sort of thing that once you have your list of things you can vary, in this case we're talking about cognitive level, we'll talk about structure in a minute, um, it becomes very clear how you can take a t a, a, an example of a performance assessment and revise it to test, tap exactly what it is that you want it to tap. Okay, how, as written, how much, how structured is this? Is it relatively structured or relatively open? As written, let's start with that. Mm -hmm. I think it's more structured than. Ha, we're seeing mixed messages. I would see this as a relatively open performance assessment uh, at the beginning, uh, but the explanation is uh, relatively structured. So if you're feeling conflicted, that's because there are both elements in it. How could you, which way would, should we go? How could you make this even, how could you make this less structured? How could you, uh, hem this in a little bit. Now we've already had the suggestion to, um, to give them the poem, so let's, let's see if we can do it some other way. 
how could you make this more structured? Or not give them a topic that would make it less structured. How could you make it more structured? Do you think? Keep going with, keep going with more. Yeah, I, I actually did say less uh, at first. To make it less structured, what would you do? Oh, I'm sorry. To make it less structured, you, you would give them, yes, you could have, you could make it more structured by having specific requirements for either the essay or the poem, or both. You could make it less structured by giving them choices about story, poem, or paragraph, or song, as long as there was imagery in it. You're getting it. You're, you're, because you have your little toolbox of the things that you can vary. Let's, um, for the sake of time, let's go on to another example, because our non-language arts teachers are still going to say, when are you going to get to me? There's a math example. Take a look at it. What cognitive level and how structured is it as, it, as written? Okay, I, I see a good answer. I'm waiting for some more. Okay, and we're getting sort of a consensus here. The, the top, the math problem itself is application. It is very structured. What opens it up a little is that students have to show their work in two ways. Um, and they can pick which two ways. And uh, in math, being able to explain things in different modalities like that is actually a thing. Uh, it, it actually is. Uh, helps you see how the students understand the math. So that is um, much more open and it will all, would also give the, uh, the teacher a, a way to observe how the student's mind, mind works around that, it's a division problem, right? So around that division problem. How could you make that, how could you make that more open? If you didn't want just an application, if it said students will be able to use the principles of division to solve real life problems or something like that, how could you how could you make that less of a closed application question at the beginning? Have the students write a problem themselves. You could also have this, uh, leave part of the problem out um, and say, May is going to bake cookies and she has, she wants to give all, each of her friends two cookies. How many cookies sh could she bake, should she bake? And then that would be partly structured. Uh, each kid would come up with a different answer, but as long as they explained it as the number of cookies they'd need to give to that number of friends, that would be, that would make it more open. Uh, an important part of this assessment is that it's that what makes it a performance assessment instead of uh, just a math problem is that showing your work. And before I leave this slide, I want to make sure that we emphasize that. Okay, science example. How could, well, let, let's, before I ask questions, just take a minute to read it and see what we've got here. This one's a little bit bigger. It's not a, a, a short performance assessment. Not quite as short a performance assessment as the others. Okay, how open is this? Is it very, very structured or very unstructured? We 
we're getting uh, lots of answers converging on somewhat structured, which I would agree with. Uh, the, uh, this is actually a question about, that, about experimental design, not about popcorn. And uh, the design needs to take into account variables that need to be controlled, like the number of kernels you start to pop to begin with and the amount of oil you put there and the temperature that the popcorn popper machine that you use. So what the, the rubrics would be looking for would be experimental design reasoning, uh, not so much stuff about popcorn. It leaves open, what it does leave open, ah, that's a good question. I see that. What, it, what this does leave open is uh, that uh, the, the students are free to design any kind of uh, experiment they want to. They could do it in their kitchen with a popcorn popper. They could do it in a lab with a frying pan over a Bunsen burner. They could, um, they could use a, an air popper. They, 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 could, they could do lots of things. The actual conduct of the, of the lab is pretty open, but the question is very closed. In fact, it, the first sentence tells you what the question has to be, and the, um, the form of the final performance is very closed. They've been taught a conventional lab report format. So what is open, or what is, I guess I would say guided in my little three-part format, what is guided is the methods and materials. Somebody's asked a good question about how the openness of the performance assessment might impact the validity and reliability of a task, which is an excellent question. Um, for validity, that's one that you have to call. If the standard suggests that students should be able to do some open-ended reasoning, then it is the most valid way to assess it is to give them a task that has some, uh, has, has less structure to it. Whereas if the standard says that they need to be able to do something in a very controlled way, the, so, so the business about validity has to do with the match with standard. Um, in this case, I think you could probably find a science practice example about experimental um, reasoning, scientific reasoning, uh, that would suggest that students should be able to think their way through uh, some, some design issues. Reliability is another, uh, another matter. The more open your task, the more different, kind, different student responses you're going to get. So reliably observing the quality of those in a comparable manner is going to be an issue. The way you solve that issue is to write really clear rubrics that allow for all of the possible good answers and would allow you to, um, to not give much credit to possible poor answers. And the way that you would do that would be to make sure that you describe the thinking, the open, in this case, uh, the open part is the, the research design part. So you would want to make sure that the rubrics that you wrote for this would very clearly suggest what you were looking for in the method and materials that they designed, no matter whether, um, whether they did it uh, in the lab or in their kitchen. So if I hear you correctly, we should probably do a form. Oh, the framework that I put up there with the three parts and how open it should be, I use that for the, the teacher to design the task. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't give feedback to the students on that. You would use that to help you design something that was aligned to standards. Um, and you would, you would make sure that what the standard was calling for was what was reflected in your task. Oh, it, well, yes, indeed. Then, <laughs> thank you, Teresa. Yes, um, I I think that that uh, framework, because it is so um, simple, and because it casts a performance task as a problem for students to solve, um, 
I think that works very well. I have used it myself successfully, and so have some teachers I know. Yes, you can give feedback to the teachers about the design of the task using that. I thought you meant feedback to the students, and, and no, but yeah, that is a teacher-facing framework. Okay, very cool. Um, I'm going to move on for the sake of time. Uh, I did have a social studies example, uh, but rather than, uh, how much do I want to get through in the next 25 minutes? Um, okay, we'll do a real quick question on this one. So here's a social studies example. This is, uh, this is uh, literally a photograph from the early 1900s in Oklahoma. Um, compare it with, and you, we would, the task would ask students to compare it with their own classroom. Find at least five things that are different, very structured, right? Five things. Choose one of them and write an essay about how that aspect affects your own learning. So relatively closed, uh, what's open about it is the, the, when the students talk about their own learning, they would all have a different story to tell. Relatively closed though, what cognitive level? I, I can imagine getting a a chorus of different opinions on this one. I'll tell you what I think it is after you tell me what you think it is. I've got two answers. Anybody else? Okay, I would tend to agree with the analysis people because we are pulling out parts of one classroom and connecting them with parts of another classroom, your own. Uh, I have had people argue for evaluate because they said the students will have to decide what is good for their own learning. And I get that reasoning uh, and I wouldn't argue against it. Uh, I, I personally would peg it at analysis. So, um, and that seems to be the, the consensus there. And if we wanted to, we could vary the structure, the difficulty level, and the uh, cognitive level of this one as well. So any of those would be examples of things that are performance assessments but not huge ones that might be um, something that would give people some ideas. And I hope you can see that all of them, design-wise, are light years from the terrible explorer one that we start. I like to start with a good counterexample, because everybody likes to, likes to pull out their red pencils and, and, and uh, say what's wrong with something. And uh, as I said, I did get that off the internet. I did sort of blind it, so whoever put it up there, I hope, is not going to recognize how we're picking at it. Um, so anyway, I did want you to see, though, more good examples than bad examples. Uh, I, I need to change the subject now and remind you that both the performance and how you observe or score it defines what kind of evidence you get. So any of those tasks that we saw that were good as they were or perhaps we, uh, good as we tweaked them, depending on what it was exactly that you wanted to measure, uh, would eventually go out the door and go home with the student and you would be left with whatever score you had decided to give it based on the rubrics that you had written. So the idea is the work goes home, the rubrics, the, the, the appraisal from the rubrics stays. We need to make sure that those rubrics do what we need them to do. And I also need to, right out front, clarify what I mean by a rubric. Uh, some people call any scoring scheme a rubric, and that is not true. Checklists, rating scales, and point schemes, and true rubrics are all different things. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to, there we go. Which one of those which one of those is a checklist? Yeah. Okay. Yes, excellent. 
that's that upper left hand one is the uh, is the checklist which one of them is a rating scale the math problem solving one yes And which one of them is a true rubric? A tiny one, true, but which one of them is a true rubric? The last one. And that is because they all have criteria. Each one of them has criteria. But the true rubric also adds performance level description at each level of performance. And what that does is it prevents the rush to judgment that the rating scale will have, where it, you might know that you're good, but you don't know what's good. Now, a true rubric eventually gets to the judgment. We know that a two is better than a one, which is better than a zero. But it doesn't do it by going right to the number. The, um, the actual mechanism by which you do that is by matching the student's work to a description. And you match it to the description that best describes it, and that's where you get your two, one, or zero. So that's what we're going to talk about. True rubrics that have both criteria and descriptions of performance quality. Uh, I think I already said that this is important because there's more useful information in rubrics. Here is an example of a fifth grade teacher's rubrics. Um, Parker and Brayfogle published this. Brayfogle was the, the fifth grade teacher, I believe. And she took the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics categories, which you can see across the top there, and she uh, adjusted the language under them to be student-friendly and to kind of match what the Pennsylvania state test looks for, because that's why she was doing this. Her kids were very good at showing math knowledge and solving problems, but they were less good at explaining their reasoning, and on that particular test they needed to do it. So she used this rubric with the students over five weeks with different problem sets. And she had the students rate themselves because they could read these um, examples. For instance, they, would, they could read, I write what I did and why I did it. I explain each step of my work and so on. And then at the end of the, each of the weeks, she had a little conference with each of her students and they would tell her why they thought their math explanations were rated the way they were and uh, what they were going to do to try and get better. And lo and behold, with such a clear rubric, they did. Even her learning support students did, which was very cool. They did that because in the performance description, there was enough information for students to use to actually improve their learning. Rather than create, yes, if you can find a good rubric, that's, that's fine too. Make sure that the, the rubric uh, has all the criteria we're looking for, and then if it's the right one for your project, go ahead and use it. In the next slide, what I did was pull out her criteria and turned it into a rating scale. I hope it's really clear that students get much less information from that sort of thing. And also, you'll have a little bit of a reliability problem for that because it really doesn't say what you do to get a happy face, a straight face, or a frowny face. So how do you select the criteria? Oh, and, and uh, by the way, um, the the people who are asking about prepared rubrics, depending on what your performance task is, you may have to write a rubric because there may not be one. Uh, so it is very important that you can write one that actually uh, assesses all of the characteristics, including the thinking. Um, I'm not trying to say that state rubrics aren't great. It's just state doesn't have a rubric for every performance task you might be coming up with. So the criteria should be about learning, not about the directions for the assignment. And they should be matched to the learning goal. Effective criteria need to be appropriate for the task, appropriate for the learning goal you're trying to assess. 
They need to be definable. You could explain what they mean, something you can actually observe, distinct from one another, not overlapping so much that if a kid gets uh, one level on, on one criterion, he'd be that way on all of them. Complete for your purposes, meaning, uh, or can we go back to the smiley faces? Um, if I have time, I will. Uh, give me a minute to finish this thought and then we'll, then I'll see where we are with time. And able to be described along a continuum because that's where your performance description will be. So the better set of criteria, um, so that I'm, I'll move along here, so maybe I can go back to this, is the ones that are more detailed as opposed to the uh, criteria we all got when we were in high school, maybe, content and mechanics. Effective performance descriptions need to be descriptive, not evaluative, clear to the student, covering the whole range of performance. Sometimes teachers say, oh, none of my kids would ever get a one. I don't need a one. Yes, you do. You need, they need to see what the whole range of performance is, even if you don't have any kids that are at the lowest level. It needs to be clear what, what performance quality distinction is among the levels. Why is a four better than a three, better than a two, better than one, or however many levels you have? Needs to center the target performance at the appropriate levels. Uh, for instance, if you have a category called proficient or a category you're going to take as proficient, the description there needs to match whatever proficiency is supposed to look like um, and not be at some other level. And it needs to have parallel descriptions from level to level. Whatever you describe in one, um, uh, in one level of a criterion, you should describe in, a, in the next one. So let's talk about choosing that language. I have a bad example here and a good example of a grammar and usage. Now, this would not be the whole rubric. This would be just one criterion in a larger rubric. And you may not be writing your own. But if you were, why is the second one better than the first one? Why is the second example better than the top example? Yay, first time through. The top one is just about counting things. The bottom one is about meaning, and if this is in a story, that's another good thing. That you can only uh, get a four on the top one if you're perfect. And believe me, nobody, even you, if, if you wrote a fourth grade or third grade or fifth grade paper, would not always be perfect. Plus, there's the issue that what if a student attempted some rather complex text and did a really nice job but dropped a comma or two? And another student wrote a rather, um, a set of rather short sentences, all simple sentences, but got all the capitals and periods in the right space. By that, by, by the, the logic of the top one, the, the second student would have, would have the four and the first student would have the three, and that's probably not measuring what you want it to be measuring. It's almost never a good idea just to count things. In fact, if you find something where just counting things is what you need to do, probably it's not a rubric that you need. For instance, if you're teaching kids keyboarding skills, words correct per minute is what you want. Just count them. Don't, don't bother with a rubric. Um, let's, this is a two-slide example, which is going to be difficult to talk about, so let's go to the third example. This is another example of that same criterion where the top one is really just about following directions. They were supposed to give a, a, a presentation and it was supposed to have props and visuals. And really the top one just says, and these things existed. At that rate, it shouldn't even be in there. If you want to assess the visuals that students use, it ought to be for some content-related reason like maybe the, the diagrams that they show of the atoms and, and molecules really help the students understand what they're presenting. And at that rate, it's more than just following the directions that said you had to have visuals. 
And the, the second example gives an example of that. I have an example here of a, of a teacher who uh, it graciously has allowed me to share both the before and after version of her uh, rubric. And this is not a performance assessment I would recommend. It was a volcano, it was a, it wasn't a volcano one, it was a um, life cycle poster project. And it was just basically comprehension. They had to make a poster with the life cycles of, it, of their chosen animal. Uh, that's a, a lot of time for a comprehension level thing. But it makes a great illustration of how to fix up a rubric. So, and I do, I do have permission to share the before, which is very nice. So notice that on the left, only three of those um, criteria have anything to do with understanding a life cycle of an animal, that animals have life cycles, which was the standard she was going for. There is no science standard in her state for putting titles on posters. There is no science standard in her state for making neat posters. So, and then she has, in, in most of those uh, performance level descriptions, she has the kind where she just counts things. So she's likely to get um, incorrect information about level of understanding because she doesn't have any way in there to match the student's thinking as they put the uh, uh, illustrations together uh, about life cycles. So we revised them. We revised the scale for something that has a reason that has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. But notice we got rid of the two problem criteria and we rewrote the uh, performance level descriptions so they now go to meaning, sort of like the grammar one that you just critiqued yourself. You see that? All right. So what about the title and the neatness? She was going to put these on her wall. She didn't want junk on her wall. You can assess that. You just don't assess it as part of the assessment of the content or the thinking skills. You don't use it for grading. You use it behaviorally. If, it's, if there's enough of them, like there were for this one, uh, you can make a checklist. If not, it can be as simple as why George, that poster doesn't have a title. Here, I'm going to give it back to you and just if, put a title in it and then then turn it into me. Students can use these themselves. They can use these to check their own work before they turn it in. You can use it to check their own work. It's not that you don't assess the requirements for the assignment. It's that you don't count them as evidence of learning toward a standard. Okay, your turn. There is this one I also got off the internet, but I changed enough of this that it's um, that it, I don't think the, the originator will recognize it. There are three standards here. Out of six, there are three criteria that don't belong. Which ones are they? Three out of six criteria do not belong in those rubrics. Which ones are they? I would advance to the next slide, but that will give away the answer. Student info, yes. Putting your name on the paper should be required. It should not count as understanding about volcanoes. Overall presentation. You should present something uh, neat and organized, and the art teacher or the English teacher might want to have something to say about that. But this was strictly a science thing. And the use of creativity um, is also one that I would eliminate. It's not that I mind creativity in science, but if you read the creativity criterion, it's not about being creative about your understanding of volcano. It's about being creative about the art uh, media aspects of your work. 
which does not go to the science standard. So the people who put, posted those things were right. Now, here is the reliability issue and the validity issue. If 15 out of 30 points are for things that don't belong, then if you think of the total score of 0 through 30, would be 30, wouldn't it? 6 times 5, yes, indeed. Um, the possible score is 30. 15 of those points are noise, if you think of like a radio signal, and only 15 of them are signal. Only they're not even a great signal because most of them are just counting things. But even if you rewrote those to have better performance level descriptions, you've still got half of your score that's noise. That is not valid. So, but this could easily be revised. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would revise it because I'm not sure that this again was, this was not a particularly meaty performance assessment, but it does give us a good example of um, how to revise rubrics, which is what, where I was going with this. So, to recap, performance assessment needs, performance assessments have two parts. The task has to actually exactly match the student learning outcomes you're interested in, the knowledge, the skills, the level of thinking. And we talked today about six things you can look for in your task to vary, to fine tune it to make exactly what it is that you want. We talked about time, long or short, whether it's a group or individual project, whether it's a product or a process. We talked about varying the cognitive level. We talked about varying the amount of structure in the task. And we talked about varying the difficulty level of the task. Until you get that task into the sweet spot where it matches exactly what it is you want to measure. And then you have to write some rubrics that actually look at the thinking that the students did, like the math example I gave you, uh, as well as the student content knowledge and skills so that you get all of those things that you so carefully tapped in your lovely task actually reflected in the score as uh, without a whole bunch of noise in extraneous things that don't belong in there. And that is my story about performance assessment, and I'm sticking to it. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Brookhart. Uh, if everyone could just stay with me for about two more minutes, there are some things I wanted to go over. This is Juliet again. Uh, these slides, as well as a video of this webinar, will be posted to Engage New York uh, under the video library, just as the past video and slides have been posted. So if you're looking for um, the assessment review webinar, you can also go to Engage New York uh, to find to find the, the video and slides. Um, our next webinar is going to be held on test construction. It's going to be held at the same time, 3.30 p.m. until 5 p.m. And this will be held on December 1st. Uh, you can expect an invite to, to that WebEx soon. And last of all, we're asking that um, folks fill out a survey on, on their experience today. This survey uh, kind of gives us an idea of what you thought of the webinar and also lets us know what we can work on for, pre, for uh, future webinars. So um, you can see the URL on the slide and uh, you can't click on it, so I'm just going to type it into the chat box now. Uh, so that you can click on it if you want to uh, fill it out right now. That would be very helpful to us. Uh, it's a very short, uh, it's a very short survey, and it's very very helpful to us. If you um, click on the, well, I'm not sure if you can click on it. You can just, I guess, copy and, and paste it into the into your uh, browser. Um, there is a comment PowerPoint handout for notes would be great. Um, yeah, and the PowerPoint slides, in addition to being posted uh, later on Engage, they were also uh, sent out to um, the, the email contact list and the alternate contact. 
uh, email addresses that we had. So if you didn't yourself receive them, whoever is the contact person for your BOCES or district uh, should have received them. So you might want to get in touch with that with that person, and we'll we'll send out the PowerPoint slides uh, next time a day ahead as well. So thank you very much. That wraps it up. Again, please fill out the survey. It's really helpful to us. We really do look at the the results and and take those into consideration. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on December 1st. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.